Yeah. Well, hello and welcome back to Discipleship, a journey of growth in the New Testament. I'm your host, Pastor Eli Rojas Jr. And we are continuing in our lesson four, um, the growing pains, the, the struggles that the disciples went through in their, in their learning and, and growing. And um, as always, we're going to begin with a word of prayer and a, and a, 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 a request of the Holy Spirit to infuse this study time with power and with guiding, guidance. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time that we can spend in your word. Thank you for the uh, blessing that we have to of, of standing on the shoulders of the people before us. And we can learn from the disciples. We can um, avoid some of their, own, of their mistakes and we can uh, keep growing and, and developing and becoming better disciples for you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a little review. We we're talking about growing pains, and we've gone through all the lessons. And so uh, if you missed any of them, they are on our YouTube page, and they're on our playlist. And I, I'm, I've titled them uh, appropriately, lesson part one, part two, and you can go through and study. We had an uh, introduction. We've been talking all about um, being pre before they were chosen to be disciples, what was the world like? And now we're going through the things that they learned as they were disciples of Jesus. And so this was one of the first lessons they learned. And I won't go through all of them, but I just like to say that we, we did have a good discussion and, and there was a lot to be learned. So um, just because you weren't there doesn't mean you can't uh, experience the same blessings. So go ahead and look us up and, and you can find all the videos uh, there on our YouTube page. And um, we got all the way down. We're all the way to lesson, I believe, uh, 23. So we have a few more to go. Um, and then afterward, the next lesson, lesson five, is going to be talking about um, mm -hmm the disciples after Jesus ascends, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, but we ended up in lesson 19. So this lesson is where Jesus is talking about true greatness. And the disciples had a big issue with um, always hustling and bustling that. But you have to understand um, that desire to be first place, um, that was actually... A, a part of being a disciple. Um, there was a hierarchy and the best and the brightest disciple, the one that was most favored, the one that was um, the most intelligent and the hardest working disciple inherited the kingdom of the, of the master, of the rabbi. So as the, as the rabbi finished his school, um, someone like Peter would be allowed to take on the, the um, teaching of the master and, and they would become the next in line and they would start their own school and they would become rich and famous based on the, um, the uh, recommendation of the original master. And so people were fighting to be on top because they were looking to, first of all, Jesus as the Messiah, they thought that he was going to conquer the Romans and he was going to give them all kinds of riches and treasures but just as the in the general form of discipleship uh, they were looking at Jesus to um, choose one of them and the problem was that Jesus never acknowledged anyone as superior to the other and so there was really no way to tell for sure who was first in line uh, in other schools in other rabbi disciple groups it would be an obvious you know the they would have been uh, given preferential treatment. They would have been allowed to uh, do things. But what Jesus did was he, he treated them all equally and um, he taught them all equally. And there are some nuances to that. And uh, we'll go over that later on. There is a little bit of a, of a preferential treatment, but not in the way that, you would, that they were used to. So a preferential treatment in the disciple in the in the normal school would have been like 
you are my greatest disciple. You are the best and you are the brightest and, and everyone else should look to you. Um, but Jesus didn't make statements like that. He didn't say, look at Peter. He's the best. In fact, he often called uh, Peter. He often um, corrected Peter and he, he often corrected all of the disciples. And um, he had a lot of time where he had to kind of break up the, um, the fight where they would be arguing with each other. And this is one of those occasions that's very interesting. So uh, Jesus is, is teaching the disciples and all of a sudden uh, there's one of the children that are there and he calls the child to himself and he sets this child up as an example for the disciples to follow. Matthew 18 verses two through five. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. So that is a power-packed uh, point. <laughs> he is pointing them and saying, you have to become like little children or else you won't even be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So my question to you is, what, what does that actually mean? Uh, I've known a lot of little children um, that really needed a spanking, that, that weren't well-behaved, that weren't uh, models that we should follow. So how are we supposed to be like little children? What's, what is it the, that we should be following in that way? I think <laughs> children are so innocent mm -hmm. and pure in their, in, I guess in their outlook on life. You know, they just, they don't basically have an ulterior motive or most little ones. So what they see is what they believe and what they say is what they mean type thing. Very so I think honest. to become, yeah. So to become like little children, I think it's it's that you're, um, I guess, I just just that simplicity and belief, mm. I that think. Faith. Yeah, the, um, I remember uh, one of my sermon illustrations, I found the uh, pastor who was talking about their child and how they were walking and there was a, a stone wall next to them on the path and before you know it the child had run up the stone wall and said daddy look and and as the pastor turns to look the child has launched itself at the dad <laughs> and he just goes are you crazy why would you do that and he's like well I, I knew you were going to catch me is that that faith that's so pure and yeah um unflinching you know they know that um, their their parents are going to take care of them, and um, and so there is a great deal of faith. Um, you know, one of the most powerful ways to change a society is by indoctrinating children. We see this in in societies where uh, powerful yeah. people have wanted to change the way that um, people thought and. Unfortunately, the first thing they start to do is change education, change how they how they educate their children. And because children are blank slates, they're, they're, they're like balls of clay. You can form them and shape them. Um, and too often, uh, I'm talking to people uh, who are older about Jesus and about what the Bible says. And I'll hear something like, well, I just... I just can't agree with you on that. And we're coming to the time when uh, opinion is law uh, to, the, to the point where um, you really can't convince people anymore because they, they hold their own opinion above any other truth. And so, you know, you look at children and how, how easily they soak up information and how you could tell them almost anything you know, we, we take advantage of, the, of their believability. And I honestly think that we can hurt our children by lying to them early on about different things. 
um, like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and, and the Tooth Fairy. Um, not that those things are bad in themselves, but, but when we teach them to believe things so hard, so strongly, and then later on they find out that we were lying to them, it shakes their, their, their beliefs a little bit. It always, there's always like a crisis of belief. And, and the good thing is that most of those children um, are young and they kind of just shake it off and, and keep going with their life. But, um, you know, that, that's one of the things is that you can almost tell a child anything. Um, I can't imagine, I don't even have a list of all the things that I was taught as a little kid that turned out to not be true. Uh, you know, if you, if you eat a watermelon seed, you'll grow a watermelon in your belly or something like that. Um, but that's one of the things that Christ is telling them is to be faith, to have that faith, to have that, um, that openness, uh, open heartedness, open mindedness. But then I think when the key word is in four, humble themselves, humble, uh, whoever humbles themselves as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to humble ourselves as a little child? Well, you kind of uh, hit something, kind of alluded to it, along with the faith. One thing about a kid is they have that dependence on their father, and we need to start putting that dependence on our father instead of trying to do things our own way. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, that dependence is important, yeah. Uh, you know, especially in this society we're talking about, um, there was a hierarchy of honor, and the more, um, the the higher you were in the hierarchy, you know, it, you couldn't help but be more proud to be more um, honor. Honor societies always have an issue with pride. You know, you think about. Uh, like Japanese cultures and I mean uh, uh, the older mentalities um, you know a lot has changed but in the Middle East as well um, where uh, we see this in the Bible where um, you know the the brothers of um, J the Jacob's sons the brothers of of Dana um, how sh she is taken advantage of and um and for honor's sake, they end up killing an entire city. Um, and you see this in, in societies where honor is very important. Um, people will hurt other people. They will do dramatic things that some people have even taken their own life um, to, to save honor, to, to protect. But ultimately, pride and honor go together. So the more honor... Um, you're connected to the more you're looking for honor the more you're proud and 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 the more you'll be um vigilant to protect your honor which comes in in the form of pride so you know if if uh if you feel if you're if you're in that honor system where you feel like you're very important and someone who's less important doesn't say hi to you or doesn't bow to you or doesn't shake your hand or doesn't do something that you feel like is owed to you, immediately you feel disrespected and you you are liable to do something dramatic to hurt the other person. Um, and, and Jesus was, was attacking that society, that culture of, because I am in a higher regard, because I'm in a higher position, I'm owed so much more respect and we still struggle with that today because we act like respect is something that you're that you have to earn and we act like certain people need to be respected and certain people don't need to be respected so you know we talk about respecting our elders we talk about respecting people in authority but then we also in the same regard lack respect for people who aren't in authority or we will lack respect for younger people um, because, you know, okay, well, you owe me respect, but do I owe you respect? And we still have that stuck mentality where we think that 
uh, if I meet the president of the company, I need to show him greater respect than I would to the janitor of the same company. Um, but I think most of us have come to understand that that's not, that's not true. I need to respect everyone. Um, I really, I mean, it's not that I need to, you know, spit on the CEO of the company or I need to be rude to them, but I also need to show the same level of respect to the janitor and I need to show the same level of respect to other people. And, um, and you would see children um, in that society were abused in a lot of ways. They were spit on, they were uh, considered unimportant um, most of the time. I think in the temple, they weren't allowed to go into the temple until they were of a certain age. And, um, you know, they had a very low level of respect in that society. And especially if you were in a bad family, and especially if you were female, you know, unfortunately. Um, and so there was so much disrespect that was offered to children, but children learn to be humble and just kind of, um, you know, earn the respect of other people. And even in our, in our society, uh, if I feel like I'm important, then I feel like more respect is owed to me. And if I feel like you're more important than I feel like I owe you more respect. But to be humble is to not to not expect certain people that, to people to treat you like royalty or to treat you like you're the king of the of the castle, but to to just accept kindness when you receive it and and not allow pride to puff you up and to make you think that you deserve different treatment, you know, just to be humble and 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 thankful, you know, and grat grateful, especially in Thanksgiving, um, our society has come to a point where we've lost our um, our thankfulness to a, to a certain extent because the day after Thanksgiving, we're already talking about, the day after we're supposed to say, I'm so grateful to God mm -hmm. for all that I've been given, we're already talking about what else can I get? <laughs> and so, um, you know, there's a lack of humility, there's a lack of thankfulness and gratitude that is going in our society where um, you see people are disrespecting people because of the color of their skin, because of their position, because of where they're from. And to be humble is, is one of the most important uh, characteristics that Christ is emphasizing in this point to the, to this, to the extent that he says, Unless you are like a child, unless you're humble as this child, you can't even go to heaven. And that should be something scary to those people, especially when pride has puffed them up and pride has made them feel like they're better than other people. Um, be careful because pride is also able. I mean, we think about, uh, you know, murder and horrible things that are done keeping us out of heaven, but um, we should not be so surprised when some people aren't able to get into heaven because of their pride. Um, and so that's a dangerous thing that we need to uh, root out in our own hearts and minds and be like little children. Um, is there any other thing, any other lessons that you, you gain from, from this passage that speaks to you in this passage? <laughs> okay. Well, I I really liked this uh, this this section. I think it was probably one of the most um, hard hitting messages the disciples could receive because in their in their society it was all about respect and honor, and Jesus basically tells them none of that matters. If you don't humble yourself, then you will never get into heaven. So this was one of the most um, topsy-turvy lessons where he's basically flipping the whole society upside down. And um, and it would have been a difficult pill to swallow. In fact, to the day that Jesus died, the disciples were still arguing over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now we go to the, to the sending out of the 70 in Luke 
10, and it's similar to the first going out. And there's some uh, scholars that say there's 70 now because the first time that Jesus sent out the, the 12, uh, they found out, they found more people. And so you look at um, how many times 70 is divided by 12, and it's about uh, six, six times. So uh, basically, all the disciples went out and, and found uh, six more uh, disciples to follow and to, to lead in their ministry. So as early as, as a year into the ministry, a year into um, being disciples, they were already tasked with creating, finding more disciples and growing the ministry. Discipleship is not one of those things where you become a disciple and then graduate five years later and then have a second graduation 10 years later. It's almost expected to happen immediately that as you're growing, you're also searching and, and finding disciples and, and sharing what you've learned. So let's read uh, 10, 1 through 3 and, and 17 through 20, these six verses. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his fate into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So um, this is a powerful passage as well we see the disciples going out two by two, um, which is kind of tough for us single people. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, um, it is, it is a, a ministry that requires um, can, um, relationship. It, I mean, not that you have to go with your significant other, but um, yeah, you need to go with um, others. You need to take partners because Christ did not create us um, to be doing everything on our on our own, you know, he wants us to team up with people. He wants us to work together to do the church. You know, we have a a problem in our society where about 20 percent of the congregation is doing about eighty percent of the work, and um, and really, uh, it's had its negative effect because um, a lot of people in churches are lethargic. They're not active they just they have a poor spiritual growth and and they kind of go year by year unchanged unmoving um and god um is expecting us as disciples to find a ministry partner and to go out into the community to to talk about jesus to not just evangelism but but ministry you see that the disciples um were casting out demons and healing people and doing all kinds of things. So that goes into health, that goes into um, spiritual uh, battle, spiritual conflict. It goes into um, all kinds of areas. So we, we shouldn't think that, um, that our only job is to preach um, because there's a statement by, um, uh, he's, uh, He's a famous church father, um, starts with an A. But anyways, he said, um, preach in all times, in all seasons, and if necessary, by all means, use words. Um, in other words, we, we have to live our testimony. We have to go and, and make a difference. Um, but all of us are called to do some kind of ministry. All of us are called to be active in our communities. And... Um, and, you know, not, not all of us are called to preach, but uh, to witness is conversations, is relationship building, and things like that. 
So let me ask you this question. Why do you think um, our disciples today are so underprepared to, to do things like, um, you know, cast out demons and, and um, you know, heal and, and perform miracles and things that are so clearly uh, visible in the Bible why is it that we are so underprepared today to do these kinds of ministries? I think you mentioned it earlier when you said that we're kind of sleeping. Mm. You know, we, we fall into a lull and everything, we're comfortable. So why would we want to do that? You know, like, <clears throat> oh, well, I go to church, I got a job, I've got a house, everything's good. And we're not seeking to to rise above that. But if we were in dire straits and struggling and financially burdened or health or whatever, then we would be seeking God and mm. then seeing miracles, more miracles. That's, that's kind of what I think. Because you do kind of get lackadaisical. Like, oh, everything's good. Unfortunately, comfort is the greatest enemy of the Christian. Um, you know, we think that demons and... And spiritual warfare is like, oh, you know, what's really the enemy of Christians is Hollywood or, you know, it's it's government. It's all the, you know, the the Illuminati and all these Satan worship. But the the greatest enemy of of Christians is really uh, comfort. It's very it's very powerful um, drug that kind of keeps us from growing. And um, and if we we're not growing, we're dying. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians, um, they don't want to get beyond their comfort zone. So it's very uncomfortable for us to be, you know, especially if you've had a long week, you've had a long week and you're like, man, I'm so tired. I just kind of want to chill out and, um, and not do anything. But um, we have to remember that church isn't always, isn't just about what we receive, the blessings that we receive. But it's also about sharing blessings with other people. And so when we have that mentality of I'm coming to share, not to get something out of, um, then we're able to receive a lot more. And we're able to grow a lot faster and we're able to feel more of the presence of God. Um, too many times I hear, well, I didn't get anything out of the service today. Well, if it's if it's like potluck, I mean, if they, if we only got two people contributing, then yeah, there might not be enough food for everybody. But if everyone comes saying, "I've I've come to share what I have," um, even if it's not the main course, even if I just you know, I would tell people um, a few years ago, you know, even if if you could just pick up a bag of chips and you know bring a bag of chips for a dollar, that might be enough, you know, compared with other people, you know. I can't cook enough to um, to do a really good job. You know, sometimes I bring food and and it ends up um, hanging out at the end of the table or underneath some other things, and and it ends up not getting eaten. But um, if even if I'm not a great a great cook, at the very least I can bring a bag of chips or I can bring some dip or I can bring some veggies that have been cut up or something, and if everyone contributes, then then we're going to have blessings that are overflowing. But, um, you know, it's very easy for us to say, oh, well, you know, I'm not a great cook and I'm not I'm not that comfortable doing this stuff. I'm just going to let other people do it. And um, and we start to get comfortable in our roles and in what we do. And um, and it ends up hurting us, but also ends up hurting the mission. And um, and it's, it can be very dangerous. It's actually dangerous for us as Christians. Now, I do want to say there's times and seasons, you know, there's a time for rest and there's a time for work. And, you know, I can't just be like, well, everybody's got to be uh, putting at least 10 hours a week at church or, or else the church doesn't run well. But um, there's a ministry for everybody. And, um, and we just, we have to come with that mentality. What can I how can I bless other people? What can I do to share my blessings? Not just what can I receive. Um, but 
uh, God is calling us, even, even if we've only been members for a year or we've only started learning, God is calling us to, to work in ministry, to reach out to other people. And there's a lot of work to be done. The, the, the verse two says, the harvest truly is great, but there are laborers are few. So we, I've been praying this prayer, and I hope that you all will join me in praying this prayer, that he will find us more people that are willing to work and help and do the ministry. I think we have time for a couple more lessons, so let's keep rolling. Any other comments before we move to the next uh, lesson? Okie dokie. All right, let's go. So the next one is Mary and Martha. I might be having deja vu, but anyways. <laughs> uh, Mary and Martha. So um, let's read this. We did cover this. We totally okay. did, but it's okay. And uh, this is a nice refresher. So we'll go through this quickly. Yes, yes. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one mm -hmm. thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. So because we've covered this before, let's just say something briefly. And Mary mm -hmm. and Martha are both important for ministry. Um, but we have to remember that in this, in this conversation, they come to symbolize uh, work without relationship and, and the, the importance of not just being busy in ministry, but also being connected to Christ. So it's almost the difference between legalism and, um, and relationship and love. And, and so we can be busy in our Christianity where I can look at myself and um, and and our elder Rob has has these things like badge of honor and he says things like that um, that that kind of go along with it where we think okay well I go to church every week you know I'm I'm helping out with this and that I'm doing this you know the other day I told my neighbor about Jesus and I gave him a book uh, look at all these badges and we're working but we're we're, we're focusing more on what we're doing and not so much on the relationship that we should have. And, um, and the, the balance needs to be both. We need to do the work that is before us. I mean, if Martha wasn't working, um, you know, I think she was putting too much pressure on herself, but if she wasn't doing anything, then nothing would be done and everything, everybody would be sitting around waiting for something, but uh, Mary uh, emphasized relationship more than busy work because what Mar Martha was doing was probably not urgent. It was probably something more like, well, this kind of needs to get done or I need, you know, we need to post and everything. But have, have you ever um, seen a, an event or a party or anything where it's too planned? It's, it's got too much structure and you're like, well, you know, I, I'd really just like to, relax and enjoy myself and it seems like Martha was doing busy work and she was over doing the the tests and and really she could have just relaxed and just spent time with Jesus and um and we need to make sure that as much as we do even as as I speak to you I, I kind of speak to myself as a pastor um I'm not working nine to five I'm working uh, seven or eight to about midnight or, uh, you know, sometimes a little later. And, um, and I can be, um, I could say to myself, oh, well, I'm working on my sermon. So that's all I need for my devotional time. You know, for my devotional time, I'll just work on my sermon. Well, I can be doing work for the church without connecting with Jesus. And that's very dangerous. And that's something that a lot of pastors end up doing by mistake. Uh, so we need to um, not just work for Jesus, but make time for Jesus. Any other thought before we get to the next lesson? I just want to say, uh -huh. I've been a Martha uh -huh. yeah. in the past. And, and it's just getting that balance between um, 
you know, what needs to be done and knowing when to take a break or stop and, you know, at the foot of Jesus. Amen. Because after a while it becomes like a chore, you know, you're just doing and it's just like a run over from the work week. So it's easy done. So got to be wide awake, kind of seek God. Amen. Yeah. So the next lesson is the discussion with the Jews. And I do believe we're finally getting to the new part. So um, sorry, I, I, I thought I had edited it, but I, I, it's, it's tough when you miss a couple of weeks. So I, I did miss, I, I think it's been three weeks since the last meeting. So I, I didn't remember where we left off. But um, so John 8, 22 to 26. Um, and I do believe we went over this too. But anyways, uh, so the Jews said to him, "We will he kill himself because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are far, you are from beneath. I am from above and you are of this world and I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to, me, to you that you will die in your sins for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And they said to him, who are you? And Jesus yeah. said to them, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. And this was a very important uh, point because this is him without um, getting in trouble he he's making a public statement of his of his ministry and his uh, his authority as the son of of god not just as a good teacher and um and the disciples are witnessing that they they're starting to understand more what it means that jesus is the messiah that he is going to um help that he's going to forgive the sins and he's going to do all these things um, and this was just a moment of conversation between him and, and the authorities. And, um, and it's a, it's a deep, deep challenge for us. Um, we need to bring our sins to him and we need to, instead of our, our, like we were talking about comfort, one of the uh, children of comfort is self-righteousness where we justify ourselves and say, well, you know, I'm really not that bad. You know, I'm really not doing anything terrible. I'm really okay. You know, there's really nothing that I should feel guilty about. And guilt is only supposed to drive us to Jesus. It's not supposed to hang over our heads. Um, it's really just supposed to tell us, hey, um, there's something that you need to fix. And then we fix it. Um, and that's how we're supposed to deal with our sins but um you know where we can where we justify ourselves we can we can be in a lot of danger because uh when we justify ourselves we we lean on our own understanding and um and without meaning to we can let go of god's hand and try to try to do our own our own uh our own righteousness, try to lean on our own righteousness. Well, let's keep rolling because I, I do want to get to the other lessons as well. Um, so here we talk about divorce. And this was something that was a little hard for, for Jesus' disciples to swallow too. Matthew 19, verses 8 through 10, he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But well, from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And his disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Uh, so just in case uh, you thought that marriage was harder now than it was back then, uh, they, were, they were having the same issues back then. It was a little less. Um, it was a little less widely accepted. It was a little less common. But, but his disciples, when when Jesus says that that 
you know, the only exception to uh, divorce is, is sexual immorality. And there's, there's some things to be studied about that. And, and we can go into a deep discussion about um, the right conditions for divorce and the right situations and things like that. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we live in a sinful world and, and unfortunately things don't happen the way God intended. And, and this, you know, we can say more about this in the sense that um, it was more speaking on, on, on God's desire for us is that we um, treat marriage with all the respect and honor that it deserves. And, and we do as much as possible to preserve our marriages. Um, but in that sense, um, you know, unfortunately, the reality is that we live in a, in a sinful world. And, and unfortunately, you can't always control the actions of, of your spouse. And so um, it's become a little too common and, and too uh, heartbreaking. But, um, you know, uh, <laughs> this, it, I, I find that their, their uh, response is a little telling because we, we know that Peter was married um, before he was a disciple. And we know that um, some of the other uh, men of the, uh, the disciples in his, in his group had uh, gotten married at some point. And um, it's just interesting that their response to that is just, well, I guess, I guess we should just never marry. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things that this lesson brings out and it's something that we've learned as especially as Seventh-day Adventists is the difference between permissive will and the will of God and that's something that we need to learn um, as Christians God allows things to happen because of the hardness of our hearts and and we have to be careful about that because we can get hard-hearted about things that don't matter um, and we can think, well, I'm just going to do this. And, and I know that God is going to forgive me. But what we don't understand and what we don't see is that God has a better way for us, a better plan for us. And, um, and these plans um, are, not, are not forced upon us. You know, this is not what God, God doesn't make us. Um, follow these plans that he has for us he basically he leads us and he guides us and he tries to tell us what would be best for us but a lot of times because of the hardness of our own hearts we end up missing out on the plans that God has prepared for us and um, and it comes to marriage that's definitely true and I, I think that those who've had gone through that experience of divorce and um, and all the things you know, it's not a positive experience. It's not something, you know, you, you might have been might have been happy not to be married to the same person because of their mistakes and because of the way that they treated you, but it's not a positive experience. Um, I was talking to a young lady recently and I, I had to bite my tongue because she was telling me about how horrible her divorce is. But then at the same time, she's like, well, if I could do it over again, I would. I'm like, well, <laughs> Why, why would you want to do that again? That doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, if, if it was, you know, I, I would hope that you would do things better. Not that you wouldn't, not that, um, you know, it's, it, you know, you should live in, in shame or heartbreak for the rest of your life. But I hope that you would learn your lessons and, and not do the same thing. Because anytime, you know, you start the sentence with how terrible it was and how, how horrible and then, and then say, well, you know, but if, if I could do it again, I would. I just, I, I felt a little uh, conflicted there. I was like, I don't know how I'm supposed to respond. I would hope you wouldn't do that again. I would hope that you would uh, be wiser because that's definitely not a fun experience. I mean, um, you know, it's one thing to say, well, I, I enjoyed my girlfriend, boyfriend, but um, marriage is a whole different experience and it's tough, but um but but we we get hard-hearted about things and so we start to think that we know better 
than God. And one of the lessons that I really wanted to focus here is not so much um, the issue of divorce, but the issue of, of our hardness of our hearts. Um, this, this are, these are Jewish people who had uh, been in the church their entire lives. They had grown up, they had gone through the education system, and yet they're still learning. This is a society that basically was shaped and, and founded by God. He's the one that set the rules. He's the one that told them what they could and couldn't do. And yet, even as God did those things, he realized that there were some things that he had to compromise on because if he didn't, it would, it would ruin some of their experiences. They would, they would abandon everything because of those compromises that, that they wanted to make. And so, you know, when you hear hardness of their hearts, he's almost saying, well, I would have made this an issue, but if I would have, it would have ruined my relationship with them to the point that I would have lost everything for trying to push them to a higher standard, to a higher regard. And, um, and you know, there's a lot of things that God doesn't require of us but that God would like for us to do. And, and the, on, the only thing I can tell you is that we have to listen to the Holy Spirit and see how the Holy Spirit leads us because I can tell you right now, God has better plans for us than we have for ourselves. The question is, is our heart, are, are we receptive to the plans of God or are we hard-hearted? And, um, and I'm not talking about marriage anymore. I'm talking about career i'm talking about you know choices i'm talking about relationships um, uh, friendships and and family all those things god has better plans for us than we have for ourselves but a lot of times we're too hard-headed um to hear out those plans and we end up missing out on some of the things that god has provided for us so um my lesson that I'd like to leave with you all in this in this talk is is um don't don't close your minds don't close your hearts to God because he has something better than you have planned for yourself but it requires you to trust him and to obey him in spite of how you feel about it you know there's things that like hey I would love to make exceptions to the rules but I know that if I did it God's way, I would have greater blessings than if I do it my way. What about what about you? What does this uh, lesson speak to you? How does how does that? What what do you think is is? Um, let me ask this question: What do you think is the hardest thing for us as Christians to accept that God is trying to get us to do, even today? To be the first person. <laughs> Everyone's invited, but um, I think the rest of them are shy. So go ahead. I think this lesson has really just revealed yet again that it's really the the heart. It's our heart situation that's the problem. Because if we if we we have a childlike heart, we don't think bad of anybody or evil or we want to do them harm or selfishness and then we can forgive them and love them as Christ you know as God loves us um mm -hmm. and and that goes across the whole realm of life you know when you work with somebody in a marriage relationship everything it's just like just forgive instantly and love them as Christ does that's a good point you know I think a lot of people in our society struggle with forgiveness the way that God is asking us to forgive people. Um, you know, we have a, um, there's a statement that's from, from Jesus where he says, you know, um, love your enemies, because, do good to those who persecute you. And he says something uh, behind that that is really the key to everything. He says, you know, because if you love those who love you, you know, what difference is that from the rest of the world? 
if you do things the way the world does, and a lot of Christians have gotten into the habit of really being like the world in how we do things. You know, the world looks at Christianity and says, what's the difference? You want me to give up my music? You want me to give up what sins I'm committing and all the things that I enjoy? But tell me how much happier Christians are than I am because when things go bad, they lose their faith, just like I do. When they're happy, they're fine. And when, when you're their friend, they treat you like gold. But as soon as you um, are not their friend, they talk about you behind your back. They, they um, persecute you in their own way. <laughs> they do all these things. And so what's the difference between a Christian and myself? If you love those who love you, if you are kind to those who are kind to you, then you're just like me. And, and, um, and that's one of the hardest things for us as Christians is, okay, I have to love people who are mean to me. I have to, be, I have, to have the joy of the Lord even when I'm sad. I have to have faith even when I'm blind to what's going on and I have no idea what's going on. Um, I have to trust God even when I don't like it. I have to obey God even when it goes against my will. And a lot of people are not living in those realities. They're, they're happy when they're kind to those who are kind to them. They forgive those who are easy to forgive. But Christ is calling us to a greater reality. But because of the hardness of our own hearts, because of the unwillingness that we have to forgive, the unwillingness we have to, um, to do those challenging things, um, we miss out on some of the greatest blessings of being a Christian. And, uh, and it's something that I hope that we all will challenge ourselves with. I love my parents to death. And that's easy. But do I show the same amount of love to people who treat me rudely? Do I show mm -hmm. the same amount of forgiveness to everyone? Because that's the real difference between Christians and non-Christians is that even when I'm sad, I have the joy of the Lord. Even when I'm frustrated, I still have patience. Um, even when things are bad, I'm still in good situation because I'm depending on Jesus and I'm not depending on my own feelings. But if we're not careful, we can get hard hearted. And in spite of all our Christian things, we're missing out on the blessings that the God has because we're doing it our way not his way. What you had said before about the girl that had said that she had such a horrible divorce and, but she would do it over again. It's like, I know with, with myself, I went through divorce and it was not a very pleasant thing at all. Mm -hmm. I had been married for like 23 and a half years at the time, but I would not give up any one of my children for yeah. the experience I had in the earlier life when those chapters were not tainted mm -hmm. like the latter chapters you know but um and i, you know, I, I do understand say, what I she wanna, said i'm sorry i i was just saying i do understand what she was saying that she yeah. would go back and do it again even though it failed well and i would i would um i i don't mean so much that because especially in your experience i i understand that that's very that's good it's like you you don't trade the unhappy times for the for the good times, you don't throw that the, you don't throw everything out, you know, you, you take the good and, um, and everything. But, but my, my point was more that she, she, um, I would hope that she would do things differently. You know, I would hope that she yeah. would be wiser and, and be more mature and, and not maybe, maybe be a little more selective in her, in her next spouse or, um, you know, but not so much, you know, I know that um, you have to take the good with the with the you have to take the bad with the good. And and most of us, uh, even in our bad choices, have had a lot of blessings and have a lot to be thankful for. Um, yeah. so I understand that. I, I don't mean it to say that, you know, she. I would hope that she would wish that she'd never got married and that she never met the guy. And, that she, you know, but just I would hope that if she would do things better. He was probably different then too, though, that, you know, yeah. um, like you said before, you can't control what your partner does. You can only control what you do, exactly. how you 
treat them and, and, you know, other people in your life, you know, but you can't tell what your partner is going to do when they're not around you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it's, it's unfortunate. Divorce is part of a, of a sinful world. And, and, um, you know, if, if, um, I, I know it would, it would have been better, but, um, you know, we can't control those things. And, and unfortunately we just have to do our best and, and give it back to God and, and, um, and do what we can. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I don't mean to, you know, I know that's part of life and I don't mean to make anyone feel negative. I just, I just meant that I would hope that she would learn and improve and, um, you know, not make the same choices, but, um, yeah, it's, it's part of life. And, and, and it's just great that we have so many things, so many blessings that we can take out of those relationships that, um, I'm just, I'm glad that even in those painful moments, you can look back on all the joys that you experienced. So, um, that's great. Is this, is this really about divorce or, or is it about once you give your heart to the Lord, that you you shouldn't heart have your heart turn away to other things in the world. I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, that's a good point because um, you know he kind of uses divorce as a way of saying, by the way, um, there's a lot of better things I have for you if you would if you would give yourself completely to me. There's better plans and there's better things. But because oftentimes we, we become Christians, but we still do things our own way and we still don't give ourselves 100% to Jesus, um, that's where I think that what you're saying is true, is that the point is more about the hardness of our hearts and how, how we end up changing or, or doing making choices that go against God's will. Um, because of the hardness of our hearts, because of our stubbornness, when really, you know, God is saying, hey, I have better plans for you than you have for yourself. And, um, and I, that's what I want to emphasize in this point is, is more that God has better plans that we have to, we have to accept, we have to say, you know, um, in spite of how I feel, or in spite of what I want to do, I'm going to follow your plan. Um, we can talk about divorce. You can talk about a spouse dying, a child dying, a, a major illness. What you have to do is turn everything over to God, and He'll work it out. Mm. And sometimes it's amazing to see how He works it out mm. and learn and how it does soften your heart and how you can be, um, you can show other people how to get through these situations. And if you just stop, when you get through the, the initial pain and you look back and you're looking back with God, you see the incredible work that he has done and to me, that just opens your heart up even more to help other people that have gone through the same situation. Um, I think we all go through things. Um, maybe they're not as hard as a death or a divorce or something like that. But when we go through stuff, God teaches us. All we have to do is turn to him. And he teaches us so much. And we become so blessed by those teachings. And, and I'll give you a perfect example with Chuck and I. Chuck and I, you know, we used to go to church and do all the, the right things. I never had a relationship with Christ. I don't think Chuck ever had a relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. But because of our divorce, we both turned to God. And um, it's, it's made an enormous difference. Uh, it, you know, in our relationship and in what people see in us. And so God sometimes works in ways that we don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great blessing. 
Amen. I agree. I agree. Yeah, we have to. Um, yeah, we have to give more to God. We have to give. We have to surrender more to God and allow Him to, to show us His will. Yeah, but there's a lot that God does for us that doesn't make sense in the moment. But when we look back, we're like, "Wow, I don't know how I could have gotten here if it wasn't for those situations." So, yeah, it's that old footprints in the sand. Mm -hmm. you know you're going through the tortures of the dam but god's with you and when he brings you out the other side it doesn't mean that that everything is forgotten it doesn't mean that all the pain is gone but it means that you're open to god and to love and um that's what it's all about amen well, y'all, we are a little over our time, so we're going to close with that thought. I appreciate everyone's uh, comments and, and what you said, and I hope that you've been blessed. And we're going to go ahead and close with a word of prayer. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, I, I'm grateful to you that even in my own stubbornness and the way that I hold on to things, um, you're, still, you're still working with me. And even though you have better plans than I have for myself, and I fight you on those plans, and I try to do my own will, you're still open to me. You're still working to me. Allow me, Lord, and allow us as your children to learn to hear your will for us and to learn to obey you in, in what you do. And I'm so grateful that, that in all our choices, you've, you've uh, worked to bring out glory and honor to yourself in those situations. And, and there's so many people who, who go through bad situations, who struggle only to find that you have been just as involved with them and even more so than when, when everything was going fine, that you were closer to them, you were helping them, you were guiding them. And because of that situation, they've grown closer to you and they've given their life to you, Lord. So I praise you for those negative situations that you put us, that we go through that bring us closer to you. And I pray that you will help us to be humble, to be teachable like children, to be, to be um, relationship focused, to worry, focus on our relationship with you. And I pray that in all things, we may glorify you in all that we do. Help us to be better disciples next week as we keep growing. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.